Hey guys, welcome to Finished Work Eschatology vlog number 40. This is us putting a little bow on this series, so to speak. Not finishing our vlogs, but finishing the Finished Work Eschatology vlog. I do have some ideas for where I want to go after this, and I'll save that for another time, but we'll, we'll start those in the next few weeks. Uh, this one we subtitled Rapture, with a question mark. Not that I'm here to confirm or dispel your hopes or your thoughts on whether there is or is not a rapture. I simply want to take the scriptures as I see them, show those scriptures to you within their context, show you within their historical setting, and show you in relation to other scriptures. Whenever we talk about rapture, talking about a word that's not in the English version of the Bible, of course, uh, it was in the Latin translation of the Bible, and it is found, at least in the way we're using it, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, in the phrase, verse 17, we are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them, and that is what some call the rapture. And it is based around Paul's, the latter half of Paul's fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians, I want to read those six verses that have become so popular in the uh, teaching and understanding of a future rapture. First Thessalonians, um, I'll, before I do that, I'll say this. This, this doctrine of the rapture um, is built primarily off of the scripture we're about to read, uh, and it's only been in vogue the way it is now in the church for just a little over, <coughs> excuse me, almost 200 years. Um, there's some late 18th century writings here and there that mention it, but it became a real foundational doctrine in the church in about 1835 and then spread into North America and, and it went from there. And then the early 20th century at the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible, then the dispensational eschatology sort of had its own Bible and then began to move forward and rapture became a really big topic uh, when the world went to war. Uh, they People could see World War I and World War II as a sign of great tribulation. And then there was battle, the theological debate over if this happens, is it gonna happen before a great tribulation? Uh, the world wars made people believe, well, it'll probably happen after a great tribulation. And they started using these scriptures to confirm or deny said events. Let's read them, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Uh, just to make it clear, this word is translated as sleep, but it is dead in the Greek. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And so whatever event Paul's talking about, he believed it was one not to be feared, but one that should be full of comfort and used believer to believer to comfort one another. Uh, based upon verse 16 and 17, in which the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, the dead in Christ rise, we are alive and remain are caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, or I'm sorry, caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. According to those two verses, this does not have us living in heaven and it does not have us living on the earth. It has us living in the air, in some space between heaven and earth. Um, it also does not exclude resurrection. And so there is a resurrection that precedes the event that Paul is talking about. I believe that there have been resurrections uh, in the Old Testament. There have been resurrections at the cross in the book of John in which saints came out of the ground. The gospel records this. Uh, there were certainly various individual resurrections during the life and ministry of Jesus in the early church. And then, of course, I believe there was a, a resurrection at AD 70. 
Um, we, we talked about that in our Daniel, in our study of the latter part, portion of the book of Daniel through this, this vlog. And so we're talking about resurrection, but then what is Paul talking about when he's talking about being caught up to meet the Lord in the air? So I want to get to that as we proceed. I think one of the mistakes that we make is we try to take the verses and we isolate them. We build entire doctrines around verses. That's a dangerous way to read the Bible. So Paul didn't stop at the end of the fourth chapter. He kept going into what we call the fifth chapter. But Paul, Paul didn't even call it chapter five. He just calls it the next line. In fact, he opens chapter five with the conjunction, a rebuttal. I want to read the last couple of verses of four and then just read straight into five. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. So whatever event is happening at the end of chapter 4 is also called the day of the Lord at the beginning of chapter 5. And Paul says, you don't even have any need me to write to you about this because you guys know that that's going to come as a thief in the night. I want to ask, where would they have learned that that day was going to come as a thief in the night? I think you know that through this eschatology vlog, we've studied extensively the 24th chapter of Matthew in which Jesus gives fair warning to his disciples. And so that day of the Lord is within the, the, the framework, within the thinking rather, of the early disciples who walked and talked with Jesus, who told them about the signs, who told them about the seasons. Paul says, concerning times and seasons, you don't even need me to write to you. Why don't they need him to write? Because it was already becoming common knowledge of the things they should be looking for to precede the day of the Lord. And that day of the Lord was a time in which they would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now the word air there in the Greek in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 is, uh, is not just the atmosphere, but is the very breath of God. And I believe that what Paul is saying at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4 is that at the coming of the day of the Lord, the people who come through that period of tribulation are going to be caught up in the very essence, the very presence of who the Lord is in this new kingdom age. Paul talks in his epistles about how in the ages to come, he shall reveal things to us about his grace. And so Paul is, is looking forward to that moment. And he says, you don't even need me to tell you what it's going to look like because you know that it's going to be uh, as a thief in the night. Verse 3 of chapter 5. So when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Now I want to stop for a second because I, I know where I would have been several years ago if I'd have heard someone say some of the things I just said. So I want to say this to, to keep you going. I'm going to reveal to you in, the, in, in 2 Thessalonians why I believe what I just said, okay, about that caught up. Paul will go back to it, but it's going to take us a few minutes to get there. So patience as we go. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. We're in verse 4. So that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. We're not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, self-controlled. And the word sleep here is not dead like 1 Thessalonians 4. He is now transitioning into, listen, you people are light. You know this stuff. So let's live like we know it instead of living like we don't. Be a people who are self-controlled, who know what's coming and know what to do about it. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Why does he say the hope of salvation? Because they're hoping for a redeemer. They're hoping that the, the coming of the Son of Man will redeem them from the coming judgment. Why does Paul give them this assurance? Verse 9 is key. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is telling them, you are not here to make this appointment with wrath. You are here for the salvation that is going to come when Jesus does visit 
at the visiting of the Son of Man, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. And the Greek words here for wake and sleep are not live and die. It's awake or sleep. And so Paul is speaking spiritually. He's not just saying whether we're dead or alive, we're going to meet him. He's saying, this is a, to me, this is a testament to the grace of God. Whether we're awake to the reality or whether we're asleep to the reality, he's still Lord. Whether we're awake or asleep, we still live with him. We still live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify each other just as you are also doing. And so I used to hear it said, and I said it myself, if you're not looking for that day of the coming of the Lord, you might miss it. And Paul says the opposite. He says, even if you're not looking for it, you're in him. You are his. Now, there were certainly signs that they could be warned of that would allow them to flee physical destruction. But most of the New Testament is wrapped up around not going back to the old Mosaic economy, not going back to the old way, because he doesn't want them to go back under the things that they used to be, and he wants them to wake up to their reality. It's why Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, awake to righteousness and sin not. And so there's an element there of wake up to who you are. Wake up to the reality of who the Lord is. Now, I'll stop there in 1 Thessalonians 5, um, reminding you again, they knew these things were coming because Jesus had warned them of these things in Matthew 24. Uh, second, uh, 1 Thessalonians is 4 and 5 is talking about uh, an event that was going to happen within Paul's uh, and Paul's audience's timeline. And then there's a break between 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. And please remember, these are probably Paul's first letters. They're written, written around 50, 52 AD-ish, right in that area. Um, Paul opens 2 Thessalonians, and I encourage you to read it. I don't want to take too much time uh, getting into the first chapter, but talking about God's judgment and God's glory, and, and there was going to be flaming fire taking vengeance, and it gets, it's, it's wrath-filled. Once you've read Matthew 24 and you've read the last couple of chapters of first, as long as you know what he's talking about, there's the coming judgment. And so then we get into the second chapter and something very interesting happens at the top of the second chapter that in all my days of studying eschatology through a dispensational lens, I never, ever confronted I never dealt with what I'm about to deal with because to me, and I went 40 vlogs in and I don't know that I've ever mentioned it, so I'm saved it for now. For me, what Paul says in the opening frames of 2 Thessalonians 2 tells me that the idea of the coming of the Son of Man as, a, as something that all eyes will behold or something that is so physically world-changing that you can't miss it, definitely should be taken to task based upon the opening verses of 2 Thessalonians 2. Listen. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. I, first of all, there's not a lot of room for, for moving around there. Concerning... The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. This gathering together to him was 1 Thessalonians 4. Caught up to meet him. Is that physical? Watch. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter. As if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. The, the Greek there is as though the day of the Lord had already come. Did you catch what Paul said? He said, look, concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him, I don't want you to be disturbed thinking it's already happened. Now, my question to you is this. If the coming of the Lord is, is as it's taught in a lot of circles now, if that's the way the coming of the Lord is, how could they think it already happened? How is it possible that they could think it already happened? Well, I present to you, they, they 
thought it had already happened because they didn't expect this amazing cataclysmic physical world changing um, arrival. Verse three, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sets as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So if the coming looks like a lot of futurists proclaim, why did some think it had already happened? And another question, so much future prophecy fulfillment revolves around a standing temple, whether it's the book of Revelation, whether it's the book of Matthew, or whether it's 2 Thessalonians 2. Here's a man of perdition standing in the temple. And it revolves so much around a standing temple that one of two things must happen. Either this prophecy was happening in their day while the temple was standing, or they're going to have to rebuild the temple so all this stuff can happen. And that's how futurists treat these verses. Rather than just putting it within the time frame of people who actually had a temple, they move it into their time frame, our time frame, and demand that a temple be rebuilt. This is why there's a lot of Zionist movement. This is why we're, we're talking about getting the Muslims off the Dome of the Rock so that the Jews can have the Solomon's Temple back. Uh, it's trying to squeeze modern events into prophetic scripture. Um, we don't know who the son of the, the man of sin was, the son of perdition. We know it's the same phrase used about Judas. So whoever it is was a betrayer of their people or, or, at, or at least a man who was the personification of sin and of evil. There's a couple of plausible explanations. I'm not going to try to solve it for you. There wouldn't be a lot of argument about it if it was easy to solve. We're not arguing that Jesus died on the cross. That's easy to solve. But we argue about a lot of other things because they're not easy to solve. One plausible explanation for the man of sin was offered up by uh, Christian author John No, who was actually quoting John Bray, who I did a lot of work out of Bray's book, Matthew 24, fulfilled throughout this blog. And Bray offers that it was the priesthood who held him back, who held back the son of perdition. Uh, let's, let, me, let me read on verse 5. Do you not... Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And the new King James mistakenly translates the pronoun he with a capital H because they're assuming that's the Holy Spirit holding back the son of perdition. And that when the Holy Spirit is removed, the son of perdition come in. That's a very futurist interpretation of this scripture i used to preach that that the holy spirit's here at work in the dispensation of grace and then when jesus comes the holy spirit's taken away and then god will do all this work through 144,000 jews who will proclaim the law of moses in a rebuilt temple i didn't realize what an insult i was being to the finished work of christ that i was saying that uh people preaching the law and killing lambs could save the world better than the holy spirit and the church had for 2,000 plus years i, I don't even want to go down that road it's embarrassing but one plausible explanation is it's the priesthood who was doing the holding back. Uh, history might help this. In AD 68, uh, Jewish zealots murdered the high priest Ananus, and over 12,000 Jewish priests left their bodies exposed, which was against Jewish law. Uh, the leader of these zealots was John of Giscala. Um, John was imprisoned when the Romans finally took the temple down in AD 70. He was imprisoned for life. This could be a fulfillment. Another argument has Caesar Nero. Uh, I kind of lean that way because the 666 of the book of Revelation is the grammatical spelling of Caesar Nero. Um, Nero was held back by the emperorship, emperorship of Claudius. And so once Claudius was out of the way, Nero was able to enact his judgments. He never sat on the throne in the temple. However, such language could be metaphorical as he did declare himself to be God. There's one more passage I want to read in this study, and it comes from Romans 1, and it's one I see popping back up here and there um, among grace people and everybody else. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And I've heard grace people try to say this, was the, this happened at the cross. 
the Greek is not the wrath of God is revealed. The Greek says the wrath of God is about to be revealed. So the unveiling or the revealing of that wrath was going to happen at AD 70. And when you look at that chapter now through that lens, that will help. I'll close by answering this. What happens? What's our future? The kingdom of God is going to expand until the knowledge of the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. People say, do you believe in a physical return of the Lord Jesus? In my own heart, the jury's still out. I can see manifestations of the appearance of Jesus all throughout the New Testament. I would say if he comes back physically, what would that cost you? In the knowledge you have now that Christ lives in you as the hope of glory, what would happen to that knowledge if you knew he was on planet Earth, but he was on the other side of the planet? I'll leave that to you. Um, I'm not going to fight about it. I'm a winner either way. What I want to do is wake up to who I am and wake up to the knowledge of my righteousness. And rather than waiting for the manifestation of the kingdom, realize that the kingdom has come in Christ and Christ is in me, the hope of glory. I don't have a hope of salvation anymore. That was a prophetic thing for them. I have the hope of glory manifesting out of me, the kingdom of God all around me becoming the world in which I live. And I believe things are getting better. I do not believe things are getting worse. That'd be for a whole different vlog series. I went a little longer on this final one. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I have so thoroughly enjoyed this series. It's been one of the treats of my teaching life, right up there with our verse-by-verse -verse study on the book of Hebrews, which was one of the funnest things I ever experienced. I'll be back in the next few weeks with a new series of vlogs. Until then, I pray God's blessings on you. Grace and peace.